I was 11 when I killed my best friend. It wasn't on purpose, of course, and I felt bad about it for a long time. I still do, particularly around this time of year. I've taken to becoming effectively the world's most functioning alcoholic during the entire month of October. I drown my internal anxieties in cheap vodka that burns its way down my throat. You could probably call it a tradition now. Melanie Graham was a bright, happy kid. She skipped at least one grade and was at the very top of her class. She'd been accepted in every private school she applied to, and a couple of them gave her a scholarship. No idea why a kid like that would want to hang out with a kid like me. I was failing at least one of my classes every semester and had to visit detention enough times that I had a favorite desk. She always tutored me to at least above passing and waited until detention was over to walk home with me. Mel and I both loved the fall. It was a welcome break to the sweltering southern summer. On October 1st, we had a tradition where we would decorate a treehouse our dad had built for us a few yards into the woods behind their house, using old decorations our neighbors didn't want anymore. I'm sure it looked like a Halloween section in the hardware store threw up on that tree, but we couldn't think of any place more beautiful to spend our evenings and weekends. And it was every evening and weekend. It got to the point where my worry were of a mom even stopped calling Mel's house to remind me to be home before the streetlights came on, which wasn't hard as Mel had helped me plan out the most efficient path to and from her house. I biked to Mel's house a few blocks over in the morning, left my bike there, and then we would walk to school. She didn't have a bike and hated sitting on the handlebars, so it took a little longer than just riding over, but that was a compromise I readily made. In the evenings, i just keep an eye on the sunset. Eventually, I had the time nailed down. So a couple times, I walked to the front door just as the streetlights started glowing. The Monday before Halloween, Mel was waiting at the end of her driveway for me. Her nose was red and stuffy. I knew she had spent the night crying. I can't come to school today, she said. Why not? You sick? I asked. No, um... My Aunt Ginger, the one down in New Orleans, she, um, was all she got out before she broke down into sobs. I remembered her Aunt Ginger. She was a weird aunt, the one that left every conversation with the other participants, wondering how much acid she took in the 70s. That aunt. Mel was crazy about her, though. Mel loved her weird aunt and had a little shelf dedicated to all the weird things she had given Mel on her visits. Is she dead? I blurted. No, but she's real sick, she said as she wiped her tears away. We're flying down today to see her, so I won't be in school. Well, how long will you be gone? Dad says probably a week. We'll come back on Sunday, though. Even if Aunt Ginger doesn't, you know, he doesn't want me and the twins to miss too much school. The twins were her brothers, Michael and Martin. They were in kindergarten. So you're going to miss Halloween? I said. I tried to hide my hurt. Halloween this year was going to be Saturday, which meant extra time to finish up our costumes and stay out as late as we wanted. I guess so. I'm sorry. When I didn't respond, she said, Can you get the assignments for Miss K for me? Sure, I said, and left her without saying goodbye. I never handled disappointment well, and while I understood why she had to go, I didn't want to spend my favorite holiday alone, especially since we spent the weeks playing in the day down to the quarter hour. This week went by very, very slowly. I had never had to go to school alone before. We spent so much time together that when one of us got sick, the other caught it, so we'd both stay home from school. I had no one to eat lunch with or hang out at recess. Sure, there were other kids, but I felt on the periphery. I was lonely. The only class I bothered to pay attention to was science. We were doing a chapter on butterflies all week. The teacher even brought in a bunch of dead ones that were pinned to pieces of styrofoam. On Friday, she pulled in the big box television that usually meant the teacher was going to put on a movie and do something else. I always interpreted it as a surprise nap time 
while Mel took notes, but I didn't have that this class, so I paid attention. The movie was really boring. The names of species kept tripping me up. I'm pretty sure I spelled most of them wrong. I did find something interesting, though. The idea of puddling. When butterflies need food, but for whatever reason, it's hard to come by. They land on something moist and draw the nutrients and water from it. It can be mud or sitting pool water or even blood. The blood thing stuck with me. The following class was art and Miss Gardner didn't seem to appreciate my oil pastel picture. I made a scene of a kaleidoscope of butterflies drinking the blood from some poor slain creature. I got detention in the last class of the day on Friday. I was the only kid in detention that day. So I guess the teacher took pity on me and sent me home after only half the usual time. I gave her a quick thanks, packed my stuff up, and got out of the classroom as fast as I could. I'm sure if I had been paying attention, I wouldn't have tripped over the pair of skinny legs that were sticking out from the middle of the hallway. I fell hard on my hands and knees. I'm so sorry, Mel said, helping me up. I wanted to surprise you. I immediately forgot the sadness and anger I felt towards her and hugged her as if she was going to fly away again. I hadn't realized I actually missed her that much until I saw her. Lonely and bored, sure, but actually legit missing her. It was a new concept. We walked my bike home that day. It took the whole walk to catch Mel up on what happened at school. Who was going to the rich neighborhood for trick-or-treating? Who was going out with who? And what girls were mad at each other because they learned that they had gotten the same costume? Mel seemed distracted, which reminded me about why she was gone in the first place. Oh, um, did your aunt... Die? She said. I was kind of astonished. Just a few days ago, Mel couldn't keep herself together enough to even talk about it. Yeah. Are you okay? I said. Yep, here she is, she said, pulling out a large locket from under her shirt. You mean she's in there? I said, disgusted. Well, her ashes are. They had her burned up. Oh, okay. Well, are you still up for tomorrow? I was hoping to change the subject to anything but the dead aunt stuffed in her jewelry. Having never seen a dead body before, the idea freaked me out a ton. Sure. But do you think we'd go somewhere special? She said. She explained that she couldn't actually explain it. It was more of a see it to believe it type of thing. But she had a pretty meticulous plan already laid out. We wrap up our trick or treating by 7 o'clock. Head over to my house for a sleepover. Then we sneak out by 11.45 and bike over to the treehouse just in time for midnight. After I agreed, Mel went home instead of hanging out. She said she needed to prepare for tomorrow. I remembered that my mom had said that people grieve in a lot of different ways, not to be upset if Mel was acting weird for a while. So I let it go and told her goodnight. Halloween day was almost perfect. The weather was a decent 76 degrees and every plan we had made seemed to fall right into place. My mom took a picture of us in our costumes Mel looked like a lady we had seen selling tarot card readings in New Orleans when our family's vacation there a few summers ago. And I was the bride of Frankenstein. I remember feeling so proud that I got my hair to stand up that tall. In the end, only a few people got to see our costumes because it looked like everyone had decided to go to the rich neighborhoods for trick-or-treating. Initially, we were a little disappointed when we saw the desolate streets, but the neighbors were a little more generous with the candy since everyone was on the Atkins diet and no one wanted that sugar in their house. We got to my house exactly on time and did our best to get the hairspray out and grease paint off. By 8 o'clock, we were in our PJs with a bowl of popcorn watching our favorite horror movie in the living room. It was perfect and I felt so warm inside. My parents had been asleep for a while by the time 11.45 rolled around so sneaking out wasn't an issue. Mel made sure to leave a chair opposite the window so we could get back in quickly if we got caught, and then hopped on my handlebars so we could get to her house as fast as we could. 
Seven minutes later, I parked my bike in an inconspicuous hiding place, and Mel practically sprinted in through her backyard and into the trees. I followed her as fast as I could, but by the time I reached the top of the ladder, Mel was already settled into her spot. She was bouncing with excitement. There seemed to be a million candles, and Melanie had lit them all, so the treehouse was bathed in a warm, orange glow. The windows and floors were covered in some sort of light, colored material, and she had painted weird symbols on all the walls. There was a circle around the sitting area made of salt. I was really impressed. Then I saw the Ouija board in the middle of the room, surrounded by little gifts her aunt had given her. My stomach dropped. I knew Ouija boards were just a silly game and ghosts weren't real. I stopped getting scared of the monster under my bed years ago, but seeing everything Mel had set up and her overall anticipation about what she was planning made me very, very nervous. Mel, what is this? We are going to contact my Aunt Ginger. I told her that some older kids around school were talking about Ouija boards when she was away. They said that they tried to contact John F. Kennedy and Marie Antoinette, but the planchette never moved for them. But it didn't have Aunt Ginger ritual, she said, as she pulled out a piece of brown, weathered paper out of her pocket. She handed it to me. As I looked over the strong written note, she said, she left it in an envelope at her house. I think she wants me to talk to her in the afterlife. The ritual required specific foreign words to be chanted a specific number of times with a specific set of items, items that Mel already had. I didn't doubt that Ginger had planned this as a last hurrah for her niece. Okay, then. What's first? I asked. Mel pulled out a giant knife from behind her back. What are you doing? I shouted, and I guess my subconscious kicked in because I found myself lowering my arms from a protective position with the giggling Mel in front of me. The first ingredient is virgin blood. It says right here. She used the knife to point to the paper. I figured that two virgins are better than one. I gave her my hand reluctantly. She used the knife to slice a small cut into my finger and then to her own. She let a couple drops of her blood drip into an ornate golden bowl. I followed suit. Mel continued with the other steps on the list of paper. She asked me to chant a phrase in Latin while she used each one of her gifts from her aunt as they were needed. A small bird skull was crushed and added to the bowl of blood. A ribbon was tied to each of our wrists and a black stubby candle was lit and placed in the center of the bowl. She had a few amulets and crystals that she made gestures with and wrapped a small dead butterfly in a piece of red fabric. I remember thinking that none of these items were that hard to come by. You just had to wave them around and say some funny words and tell your best friend that you're doing dark magic. Then I thought that Mel was probably playing a prank on me. No way she thought any of this would work. She just wanted to scare me on Halloween night. I was angry, and every moment that she continued on with this, I was getting angrier. I didn't know what else to do, so I just stopped chanting. What are you doing? Mel said. This prank isn't very nice, Mel, I said, while untying the ribbons from my wrist. No, it's not a prank, I swear, she screamed at me, but I had enough. I'm going home. I don't want to do this anymore. I stood up. Please. Please don't. Let me finish first. Don't, she pleaded, but it was too late. I wish I had listened to her. I wish I had just sat back down and let her do whatever she wanted to do, even if it had been a dumb prank, but I didn't. I went to step outside of the circle, but my foot disturbed the salt and separated the line. Mel screamed. I looked back at her and saw that she had her head and arms thrown back. Mouth wide open, her muscles strained, and I could see blue veins crawling up her throat. The planchette on the Ouija board moved. Mel spoke as it pointed to each letter. Hello, she said. The voice that came out of her mouth did not belong to her. It sounded like gravel, like deep, 
deep darkness. Are, are, are you okay? The voice laughed and Mel brought her head down to look at me. In just those few moments, Mel didn't look like Mel anymore. Her eyes were bloodshot. Her sunken cheeks made her look gaunt and her lips were cracked and bleeding. She smiled at me. I'm fine, the voice cooed. Please, won't you sit with me? No, I, I don't like this game. Mel, please stop. You're really, really scaring me. She's not here, it mocked. Don't you know that, stupid girl? The treehouse erupted in loud bangs. They seemed to be coming from everywhere. Like a hundred people were banging their fists against the walls. I covered my ears and cowered. Then it stopped. The thing wearing Mel's body laughed at me as it twitched and spasmed. Where is she? Was the only thing I could think to say. I understood that this wasn't a prank anymore. It opened its mouth and a scream. The scream of a terrified 11-year-old girl escaped. The planchette shot around the board spelling out, Help me, over and over again, and barked out a laugh. I ran through the trap door and pulled it open, only to have it wrenched out of my grasp by an unseen force. It pulled it too hard, and so suddenly I didn't have time to let go, and I fell face first on the windowsill, the corner cutting my forehead open. I made myself get to my feet and looked at it. Warm blood was running down the side of my face, but I was too scared to turn my back to it. I never blinked, but it twisted Mel's face into an awful smile. He provided me with a body and a gift of a soul. Its breath was heavy. I want to thank you, properly. It gestured to a spot where I had inadvertently broken the salt circle. Please, come back inside. It said. The planchette flew to the no on the Ouija board, but the thing didn't notice or didn't care. Its glassy black eyes were trained on me. No, I don't want to. I want you to bring Mel back, I demanded. Or I'll leave. You wouldn't leave such a sweet and tender soul alone with me, would you? The planchette spelled out, Leave. The trapdoor flew open. A resounding bang made me jump, but I turned on my heel and started towards it. I'll hurt her, or I'll eat her. The innocent ones are always so tender. I could even ruin her soul, make it dark, make it spiteful and gutless, like you. It should have been you, you know. That phrase, should have been you, stuck with me, and I stopped. It was right. I should have been the one whose soul was lost, not Mel's. It should have been you, came a soft, sweet voice of Mel from right behind me. I turned and saw her. No pale sunken skin or black eyes. She was on her hands and knees. She looked so sad and helpless. I never saw her like that before. It broke my heart. Please, I can't go back. It should have been you. She held her hand out to me. Come inside the circle. Save me. I couldn't let her go back. I needed to help my best friend. I put my hand out and cautiously reached for hers. Tears were welling in her eyes, but as soon as I got close, her face contorted into something monstrous. It lunged at me, and I was able to pull myself away with only a shallow scratch across the inside of my wrist. But it burned. It felt like the sun was trying to break through my skin like I was being burned from the inside. The monster crawled towards me. It didn't look like Mel anymore. It was a pale, pink humanoid figure. Its emaciated body should have been weak, but the muscles beneath it in its skin were lithe and strong. There was no competition between me and it. If it wanted me, it was going to take me no matter how hard I fought. I backed up, but there wasn't far to go in the small space and my back quickly hit the wall. It stood and got very close, and I could feel the heat coming from inside its throat. It grabbed my face and used its sticky tongue to lick the blood off my face. It held my face near its mouth and opened it too wide to be natural. A thousand pain screams came from inside. My hands searched around blindly for anything at all. The first thing I touched was a candle, 
in the glass vase. I grabbed it and smashed it against the monster's head and ducked away into the salt circle, quickly closing it. To my horror, it reverted back into Mel's visage. My friend's head was split open and I could see bone. Blood poured over half her face. It roared at me. I looked down. The planchette on the board was moving so fast. I could barely read it. Burn it down. It meant the treehouse. The monster kept going back and forth between the pale figure and Mel as it stalked me around the salt circle. I realized that I wasn't the only one bound by the circle. It was. I knew what I had to do. I knew what it meant. The planchette moved to the word. Goodbye. I slowly placed a foot behind me, then another. The monster watched my feet, waiting for the moment that I would step out. I kept going until I knew I was close to the edge. I took a breath and dragged my foot, breaking the line of white that stood between me and death. It was so predictable. It moved towards me fast, but when it fully placed itself in the circle, I pushed the salt back with my foot and closed it again. It was trapped. Mel was trapped too. I grabbed pieces of fabric Mel had used to decorate the place and set them on fire using the candle. The wood caught quickly and I threw everything into it to fuel the fire. I refused to let myself look at the monster again when I climbed down the ladder. It had been calling to me using Mel's voice and I knew it had taken on her pitiful form again. I didn't want to see my best friend among the flames. As I ran through Mel's backyard and to my bike, I could hear the creature roar and just under it, the sound of little girls screaming. I got home and tended to my relatively shallow wounds and waited in my bed. I didn't sleep. The next morning, my mom cried as she told me that Mel had snuck out in the middle of the night. She said that no one knows what happened, but the police seemed to think that she accidentally set fire to the treehouse and then threw herself out the window to save herself. She didn't survive the fall. I didn't cry. I couldn't cry. I felt numb. Later that evening, I rode to Mel's house after the news vans and police had left. I ignored the caution tape and stood under the remains of the treehouse. Mel's body had been removed, but no one bothered to clean up the puddle of blood that remained. There were butterflies in it, taking what was left of Mel's life for themselves. I still couldn't help but think it should have been me. As of this year, that was 20 years ago, and for the 20th Halloween, Mel has visited me, heralded by a kaleidoscope of butterflies. The first year, I thought I was losing my mind and asked my parents to take me to the doctor. When the vision was gone the following day, they said it had only been a grief-fueled hallucination. The second year was the same, and then the third. By the fourth year, I had learned to shut myself in my room all Halloween night and wait until it stopped. On the seventh year, Mel's mom killed both the twins. One drowned and one strangled. Then she walked to the burned ruins of the treehouse and took a cocktail of rat poison, vodka, and a handful of pills. Mel's dad had a breakdown and has been in a long-term mental health facility. I think Mel visited her mom too. Mel tells me to do things like that. She comes to me, all bloodshot eyes and a pointy teeth smirk, and tells me to end my life, to exchange it with hers that I should be the one burning with the man, not her. My brain knows that it's not really her. It's the creature wearing her face, which seems to be slowly melting as the years go by. My heart, on the other hand, can't seem to let go of the guilt of leaving her to die in that treehouse. I've consulted several characters in an attempt to understand what happened that night. They vary in degrees of reliability but they all have pretty much came to the same conclusion. Mel would have never been able to leave that treehouse alive. We were kids, and whatever the entity that had came when Mel called upon another realm was particularly aggressive. Some said that the only reason I was able to get out was because it wants to toy with me until it can take me. 
This is its entertainment. There's a tapping on my window now. I don't want to look because I know what it is. I've locked myself in the office, 16 floors up. There's only one thing that could possibly be out there. I know that eventually, either curiosity or some sort of twisted nostalgia will make me look over to her and she'll have her face pressed against the glass with that awful, evil smile stuck on her face. She'll whisper to me as butterflies ram against the window and fall to the ground dead. I hope I can make it another 30 years, but I'll probably tire of this game faster than it does. No matter what happens, I know where I'll be when I die. I'll be with the creature that took my friend, burning from inside out.